I, I was sitting in the back where we've been sequestered <laughs> as the speakers, <laughs> and I saw lots of people doing this, even while they were clearly interested doing this. <sighs> like, oh, it's getting late. Can you just stand up? <laughs> <laughs> Shake it out a little bit. <laughs> I think you'll like my talk better. This is all about preservation. I'm not being generous. <laughs> cool. All right, that's enough. You can count that. I think that counts on my time, so we better sit down <laughs> pretty, pretty fast. I was figuring out at the end, I was thinking as I was up there, I was taking a bunch of notes, and I, I was thinking about how to start. And how to start, uh, I used to teach fifth grade, and they, rem I got to check my fly. Um, <laughs> The students would let that roll for a long time. Uh, I was thinking about how to start a talk like this after the, all the talks we've already had. And there's something, at the conclusion of every rap battle, not everyone, but when you really, when an MC, when an MC really, really beats the other MC, uh, you do this. <laughs> right? And so I partly wanted, I'm going to do it again. I, I, like, because there, there's something that goes along with it. UCSB. Like what? <laughs> I've always wanted to do it. And then it also made me think that I could probably start, we could, Mark and I, I could probably start a rap group, the old bald guys. Um, <laughs> I get to be MC Cue Ball. <laughs> um, so, is it, if, I don't know about you, but there was this thing that we had when, you, when I was a kid. I grew up, uh, I, was, I was born in 1971, and throughout the 70s, there was this toy that almost everybody had. Um, it was the thing that you had at your house uh, when you had your geeky friends over. It was pre-Dungeons and Dragons for me. It was a spirograph, and it was a circle with a gear. As so people were like, wait, I, I think I have one of those. It was a, it was a circle with teeth, there are all kinds of gears, and you'd stick your pen in it, and you'd move it in a circle, and it would make this kind of pattern. Spirographs were awesome. Um, and when I was a kid, I could spend a long, long, long time doing that. I remember, uh, I think this is background for what happened when I was in a geometry class, I don't remember what grade it is, what grade it was, I was in a geometry class and uh, they s there was some law stated that uh, triangle can't have three uh, or two obtuse angles. It doesn't work. You can't have a triangle with two obtuse angles. So that was how we were learning acute and obtuse angles. I went home, uh, this is also a habit besides taking things apart, when somebody says can't, I go, really? Are you sure? I went home and I got a tennis ball. And I started trying to draw a triangle with two obtuse angles. And it didn't work again and again and again and again. Uh, we had all these tennis balls. We had a dog, so I'd point at old, you know, <laughs> cheesy tennis balls. And, I, and, I, and so I tried it a lot. Eventually, I think I thought I succeeded. I was pretty proud. I, I, went I went to my folks. I said, look what I did. They were like, cool, you've been drawing in tennis balls. I don't really get it, but uh, <laughs> where's your spirograph? Um, so we also, I'm an only child, so I, my, uh, I, we also had an Encyclopedia Britannica, okay, which was huge, took up a whole shelf. And I got to look up angles. So it became the beginning of a kind of quest. It only lasted a day because I needed to be able to walk in the classroom the next day and say, look, I did it, right, which I did. I walked into class the next day and I said, look, I did it. I'll come back to that story in just a second. So for me, that's, a, that, that's an orientation to a question that I start almost every conversation with, at least conversations around schooling, which is what is learning like? Right? What is learning like and what is learning not like? So if I take that experience, and frankly, I had a bunch of other stories I wanted to tell, but for in the interest of time and also in the interest of honoring the work of, of the people you've been listening to, I think you can just think about the work they've done as examples to make this point. What is learning like? Um, learning likes a challenge, right? So what, that corresponds to something learning doesn't like. Learning doesn't usually like easy answers. Learning's impatient with easy answers, isn't it? When you get an easy answer, think about a video game. When you get an easy answer, when you, when you solve a problem in a video game, when you kill the whoever you're supposed to kill or you get to the next level, what do you, you, don't, you, don't, you might say, woo, I did it, but then you go on to the next level, right? Every time I have a big class of undergraduate students, I, I, we bring up video games, and I say, what happens when you get to the highest level? They say, I give the game away and start a new game, right? Learning likes challenges, and learning is impatient with success. It likes success, but it's impatient with success. Learning also likes failure. Which is, the con which is the opposite of, I think, what a lot of people think learning likes, that learning likes a whole bunch of success. Learning likes failure. It doesn't mean it's fun to fail all the time, but if you're not failing, then it's hard to know if you're learning. There's another thing that learning uh, likes. Learning likes uh, openness, right? That is to say, uh, ready availability of materials, ideas, right? What learning doesn't like, clearly in this case, is learning doesn't like hard boundaries. Hard boundaries 
There's a triangle, it's a right triangle. There was a story to go along with that, but the, the, the learning doesn't like signposts that say you can't like stay on the trail, go here, right? On the contrary, learning, real learning, I think real deep, authentic, genuine learning, the kind of learning that makes us feel alive, sees this sign and goes, really? <laughs> Or, when you're really moving, and I'll talk about really moving in a second, it doesn't even step over the fence. It busts right through, right? So learning likes a whole lot of things that we forget that it learns it, or that it likes, and it doesn't like a whole lot of things that, frankly, we find in school. When we map the course of somebody's learning, this, I take this from an educational philosopher who published a marvelous paper in 1965 called, uh, his name is David Hawkins, called Living in Trees. And he starts playing around with this metaphor of what would happen if we were to map the, the, the pathways of somebody's learning. And he starts out saying, I think it's more like, it's kind of like a tree, right? You go somewhere and you go on a branch and then you come back and it's, it's, he's, he's elevating. <laughs> One of my students is like, are you seeing the comments they're making about you on Gaucho Space? <laughs> um, in any case, uh, he, he starts playing with this idea of a tree, and he says that actually, if we were to map the way learning works, it probably wouldn't even look like a tree. It would look more like a network. It would look more like the reticulate. It's a marvelous word, reticulate, right? It shares a, a cognate in Spanish, red, which just means a net, right? A reticulate. It's a meshwork, a network. If we were to try to map the way real, deep, genuine learning actually happens, it wouldn't look certainly like a straight line. And it probably wouldn't even look like a tree, which makes it look like there are separate branches. It would look like travel all over the place. And it might not be just my learning, right? But if I were to map the ways that more than one person, like all of people's pathways through the subject matter, it might look something like this. I walk into school <laughs> with my tennis ball, right? And I go, you want, I'd gotten over the I'm going to prove you wrong thing, right? It's like, man, look what I did. Of course, the kids were like, it's lines on a tennis ball. <laughs> Geek. Uh, the teacher looked at it and laughed. I remember it very clearly. I don't remember how old I was. The teacher laughed and said, you can't draw on a tennis ball. And I was like, I just did draw on a tennis ball. And there was a very kind-hearted response from the teacher, which is, we draw on flat surfaces. <laughs> which was true, right? We, I'd never drawn on a tennis ball, and we hadn't certainly hadn't done it in school. So why is that the response that I would get? Why would I care? Where does that response come from? Because let me tell you what happened next. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't try to draw on any. I just kind of, I wasn't passionate. That'll come up later. I wasn't passionate about it. I was just like, okay, well, hey, I won't draw on tennis balls anymore. <laughs> and, and by the way, triangles can only have one obtuse angle. <laughs> the problem, we have lots of complaints about schools, don't we? Right? We have, and go on TED, look up Sir Ken Robinson. You, yeah. yeah, you guys are like, what, what? <laughs> um, Ken Robinson and a whole litany of other people have already gotten very articulate and helped us get articulate about the failures of learning and its cousins, curiosity, imagination, to happen in school, right? And he has a talk that's got 10 million views or something that schools, ki how sk school kills creativity. And then, there's always the usual suspects, aren't there? What are the usual suspects? So we know, what we don't like about school is you don't get learning, and, and I could maybe fit my own story about a tennis ball with a bunch of lines on it into that. Schools kill that kind of learning, right? School, but forget schools kill creativity. Creativity is a cousin of learning. Schools kill learning. I, yeah, I think so. I think so too. But then we get the usual suspects. What are the usual suspects? The overdiagnosis of ADHD, the overprescription of Ritalin, too many standardized tests, a constrained curriculum, crappy teachers, and the list goes on and on, right? And that's the answers we get when we resist the temptation to target kids' heads, kids' hearts, kids' homes, kids' histories, right? Because if we can do that, then we don't have to worry about school. We'll blame the kid. But if at our best, what we do is we blame the school, and we've got these usual suspects. And I want to point to something that I think is the kind of backbone to the host of problems. That's not the same as those problems. It's underneath those problems, and it's, a, it, and, and it's a fundamental error in the way that we think learning happens, right? If learning's happening this way, right, if we were to map learning and it happens this way, we act all the time like learning is organized this way, which comes from David Hawkins, too, that it's organized like a ladder, right? That it's organized in a sequence of steps, right? That it's organized first, you, what do you do in class? First, you learn how to add, right? Then what's next? Of course, right? Then what's next? 
I don't know what. <laughs> long division. <ugh. laughs> Whatever, right? Oh, I don't want to talk about long division. And then at some point you do algebra. In any case, there's this idea that learning proceeds in a stepwise fashion. And when I say, well, that's actually, uh, maybe that's just the way that the curriculum is organized. I think that it's not the curriculum that's organized that way. I think it's us that's organized that way, and I think it's wrong. I think we imagine that learning looks like this, when in fact, learning maps, maps like this. Okay? And when learning is mapped like this, we, when we operate as if learning were mapped like a ladder, what do we get? We get a quieter problem that I think is more tragic. It's not the overprescription of Ritalin. It's not, those are problems too, right? It's not the overdiagnosis of ADHD, et cetera. It's not standardized tests. What we get is something like the following. I have a student, a doctoral student, who's now, I'm lucky enough with my colleague, she's uh, Eva Oxels, and she's here in the audience. She wrote her dissertation about an episode in one first grade classroom. And inside that classroom, a little first grader, uh, the teacher was uh, sitting, well, he was sort of crouching, and he was, had a, had a, uh, uh, you know, those post, the flip charts, right? And he said something about, you know, this number is an odd number, and a student said, what's an odd number? And you could just feel, as a teacher, you could just feel, that's on, right? Teaching moment. And he said, do you remember? Like this. And he started pointing to the number line. And he did a whole, st a very short, quick, rapid, what felt like a review lesson, right? One, odd, two, even, three, odd. You could do it yourself, right? And then he went through a whole bunch of the rules, two dance together. If one dances alone, it's odd. Maybe you know, maybe there's a song about it. There probably is. I don't know it. Um, <laughs> and he does a thing and he says, so. He goes all the way to 10, so. Turns back to the flip chart. And the kid, we only have the back of his head, a kid says, no, six is odd and it's even. Or maybe it was six is even and it's odd. And he goes, it's this great moment in a teaching life. He goes, what, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool, right? What did you say? And he goes on and he says, he, he, gets, he starts pulling on what the student is really thinking about, and the student says, six can be even, or he says, six can be odd, because you can group it in two, three groups of two, or two groups of threes. So he's, or he's, he's grouping the numbers, the student's lie, right? That's what, the, wow, cool, right? And he goes, oh, and the teacher goes, oh. But that's not the rule, is it? And the look on his face says, oh, I figure out where you've gone wrong. It's not, I've figured out what you're thinking. It's, I figured out what you're thinking, and now I can figure out where you've gone wrong. I can figure out where you've stepped out of the sequence, right, and where you've stepped off of the ladder, and I can get you right back on. That's not the rule, is it? That's something that's not the overprescription of Ritalin. It's not the overdiagnosis of ADHD. It's not a standardized test, although there is something to note that there was a standardized test being given about 15 minutes after this exchange in the classroom. It's something much more subtle. Why do we get it? Why do we get an idea about learning which says that the way learning actually proceeds, even though our experience totally denies it? I've interviewed lots of people. I, every year I teach at least 100 teacher candidates. These days I'm teaching about 250 undergraduate students. They interview people. The evidence is overwhelming that this is not, in fact, how we learn. Right? So why do we keep acting as if this is the way we learn? Well, in the first place, it's easy. <laughs> right? It's not complicated at all. It reduces uncertainty. It's true. I walk into a classroom and I'm a teacher and I don't know what the heck anybody's going to say. If you ever walk into a classroom as an adult, anybody walked into a classroom as an adult? And just, wa just walked into a classroom, a bunch of kids, raise your hand high, not like this, like this, right? <laughs> and you walk in and you, even if you're the teacher, you walk in and you say, good morning, and you have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> How nice if whatever somebody says, you have a way of assessing and locating them relative for, to a fairly simple axis. Right? So it's easy, it reduces uncertainty. It's also... A misreading, a misreading of conventional psychological theory, right? Which looks often for stages of development. This, is n this may be how some stages of development roughly proceed, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing as our experience of learning. So we've got psychology, a misreading of psychology to back us up. We've got that it's easier, right? Well, th All right, so what would the solution be? It's we, we make it hard and we stop reading psychology journals? I think it's something else even than that. Where does this come from? It comes from our habitual ways of formulating ourselves, other people, and our relations. And here's my evidence for it. I have three children. One is six, one is four, and one is nine months. Waiting outside Cheesecake Factory. 
<laughs> don't act like, oh, I only eat in small cafes. You get some cheesecake at Cheesecake Factory. Anyway, we're waiting outside Cheesecake Factory. And there's another big, there's all family stuff, and there's another family out there. And uh, she walks up, and we start talking, and we talk very briefly. And what's the first question do you think she asked me about my kid? How old is she? First question she asked, how old is she? I say, my daughter's two. And she goes, oh, yeah, my daughter's two also, but she's not walking. First thing she asks, how old is your daughter? Why that question? And why the next thing, which is, oh, my daughter's two, too, but she's not working, as if now there's something to be worried about. I think it's because we, without even thinking about it, we have a habit of formulating other people, ourselves, especially children, as to where they should be on some latter version of development or learning, right? Where are you? I can place you. Where should you be? Not that low. And we do it all the time. You walk into a classroom. <laughs> what happens? You hand out a bunch of tests. What's the first thing the kids ask each other? <laughs> what'd you get? <laughs> right, what'd you get? And they don't go, what'd you get? Oh, you got an A, I got a C. Good for you. <laughs> right, what do they do? They go, oh, ooh. Or if you get a good grade, right, you say, what'd you get? Oh, yeah, I only got like 95. <laughs> right? Sensitivity to this. This is not a curriculum. This is not standardized tests. The curriculum we organize and the standardized tests we administer grow out of an underlying habit of a misconception, a mistake in the way that we think learning actually happens, right? There's another reason that we come up with the latter version, and that's that no matter what our learning happens, we walk along, and if we look back at our own learning, it looks like a pretty straight line, right? When in fact, when we were right in the middle of it, it wasn't like that at all. It looked more like this. <laughs> but when we look back on it, so there's also this other thing is that it's not just our habit, it's also our tendency to backwards map from our present space to where, right, from our present space to where we started and think that that's just how things go. And it looks a lot neater and a lot more orderly. Why should we care? Why should we care that this is what happens when learning enters schools. I haven't said anything about passion. It's already at zero. Here's what passion does. <laughs> yeah. Here's what passion does. And here's what the whole talk is about. And here's what it's leading to. The title of the talk is the fine print of passion, right? The fine print of, pa of passion says, if, you're, if learning is something like moving, we've done this walking around a lot. If learning is something like moving, passion is like having more horsepower, right? It's like having more horsepower. And it's also like having a, 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 a much more uh, clear, focused attention right? When you're passionate about something, it's not that you see a fence and you go, should I walk over or should I bust through? You don't even see the fence, right? That's what it means to be passionate about learning. So what's the fine print? If you're passionate about learning, if what you're experiencing is passion, like any of the folks in this room, like most of you, some of you with school subjects, probably many of you not, it's sure, not sure, that, let me back up a second. <laughs> Knowing myself, I'd say, oh, are you sure? It's sure. If you're passionate about something, yeah, sure, you can, you can overcome the fear of failure, you can do a lot of, you can overcome teachers who say you shouldn't, you can overcome the discouragement that comes from all the ugly stuff in school. But if you really pursue your passions in school, if you really pursue your passions in school, people aren't even going to know where to, how to think about you. Because you're going to be off the ladder and way off some, and m st teachers are going to say, what, what are you, what, what? You're going to get this. What, what, what did you say? The fine print of passion says, not just you might get lost, but you're probably going to get lost. And when you're lost in school, guess what? You're behind. You're off track. You're one of those creative types. Maybe conventional school subjects that aren't for you. Maybe you're an artist. What you do is you get, right? What you do is you get pushed out too often. And when you walk in with a tennis ball with lines on it, the teacher says, we draw on flat paper. Or when you say six can be odd or it can be even, teacher says, oh, now I see where you went wrong. Right? So the story to wrap it up, okay? I don't, uh, this is a really cool picture. I won't talk about it. I'll just end with it. Story to wrap it up. What are we supposed to do about it? 
Why, why should we care? Uh, well, first, let me first say, why should we care? Why should we care about passion? Why should we care what happens in schools? Because hearing the people here today, knowing what passion is like, knowing what happens when you're on the edges, knowing what happens when you get lost, knowing what happens, this is the other side of passion, when you fall in love with something, gives me hope for all the dramatic changes we're going through. It actually gives me hope. Because what happens is, the Afifis, they're going to fight for kids. They're going to fight for marriage. They're going to fight for health, right? We're going to fight for art. We're going to fight for the earth. Why? Because we're passionate about it. So it gives me hope. That's one really good reason that we should worry about passion. Well, well, okay, so there's a lot of other reasons to worry about passion. Like, oh, by the way, when we're passionately learning, that's when we feel most alive. That's a good reason, too. Right? So what are we supposed to do about it? Well, here's what one teacher did. I told you about the student of mine who did the dissertation about the kid who said, I think six is odd and even. Guess what? There's an article that was published in 1993. A second grade student, five years earlier than that, was sitting in a classroom with a researcher who was practicing being a teacher. And guess what happened? The second grader said, I think six can be odd and even, so we don't have to guess what you should do. <laughs> because 20 years before this dissertation, somebody else did something different. You know what she did? She said, can you show me? She took the chalk. Right? She took the chalk. She said, can you show me? And she sat down. And the kid went up to the chalkboard and he wrote out, guess what? It was the same logic. Three groups of two or two groups of three. And another student in the room said, you know, well, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen the video. It's been a long time. But I can imagine it was a, it was a, young, it was a young girl. And I, I have daughters. And I'm pretty sure that what she went was like, <laughs> if that's true for six, she said, it's also true for ten. And we, <laughs> we know ten is even. Three days later, three days, the teacher went home. She looked up set theory. She did all kinds of work in math that she never even knew she had to do. Three days later, they agreed six is even, but they had a whole new category of numbers. They called it Seth's numbers after the kid who said, I think six is odd and even. And Seth's numbers are numbers that are even but have the property of being able to be organized as even or odd. Yeah. How bitchin', right? <laughs> right? What does it mean for us? All right, so that's what it means in school. I think it's a something as simple as when you don't know what to do, stop. If you're, if you're in a classroom, when you don't know what to do, when you don't know what somebody's saying, stop worrying so hard about figuring out where they should be. Try to figure out where they are. And the way to do that best is hand them the chalk. But in everyday life, that means something different. That means, like for us, right? It's not, I, I didn't locate the problem only in schools. I located it in our habits. So it also means for me changing our habits. It means being mindful of when, we walk, when we're standing outside Cheesecake Factory and we have five or see a bunch of kids, the first thing we ask, what if we just tried something different? Like, what does your kid love to do? Yeah. That seems kind of cliche, but what, what if we just didn't ask the same question? And trying that same thing about, everyday, about schools, maybe try that in everyday life, which is instead of saying, where should you be? Say, where are you? And then, like, crouch down, maybe, because sometimes that helps. Crouch down. Instead of, saying, instead of saying, where should you be, say, where are you? Help me see what you're thinking, right? And be ready to hear something you've never heard before. And when it sounds crazy, before you say, man, you're really far behind. I think maybe you need to be in a remedial life. <laughs> you say something like, wow. And watch the eyes light up. It's its own reward. That's it. Thanks.